the Battle of Nashville Monument, which was dedicated in 1927. And it's unique amongst Civil War monuments, and it commemorates both sides of the war. And as I was talking with Ken Flees earlier this morning, it's as much a World War I memorial. It's here, right there to your left. What? You could stop here if you wish. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's, uh, it shows the, the two horses of North and South joined together to, to I guess, kill the Hun. Um, that tree over there is a witness tree. That, that pin oak, uh, which you're looking at right now, was here in 1864. It's a witness tree. Uh, We've got two witness trees on the battlefield, and that's one of them. The original Confederate lines actually ran uh, over here, and they were very exposed to Confederate fire. In fact, uh, my good friend Zita Law, who's a state archaeologist, has found when they did the construction of the interstate, Confederate trench line running through here, which she immediately hid again. She knows where it is, and we know it's somewhere around here. But uh, she reburied it to make sure that nobody could uh, come in relic. state it is a ruin it, it's interpreted as a ruin that decision was made by metro parks 20 or 30 years ago uh, it is on the national register of historic places for the civil war construction and for the wpa construction um we're yeah we're really not sure where does where does the wpa construction start where does the civil war section end it's kind of hard to tell um there is a, a stone expert at Metro Historical Commission, and he told me that the way that they cut this stone in the Civil War is one guy would hold a piece of rebar, the other guy would hit with a hammer, they would turn it just a little bit, they'd hit it again. So if you're able to find one of those holes with the bottom, it'll have a very distinct star shape. Star girls, star. Re rebar. Okay. Yeah. So, so I can't, yes, well, <laughs> I'm glad you're, I, so, um, so I have found those distinct star shapes, um, and then there are, there are holes where the bottoms are completely smooth. So from what I understand, the star shape is the Civil War and the smooth is the modern.
can see just what poor quality the limestone is yeah. in Tennessee, Expe and especially the wall right behind you. That's a, a really good example of the, the degradation of this site. Um, the last piece of this wall just fell maybe a year ago. So it's really crumbling quickly. Um, we were very lucky to get the historic structures report when we did, because it really told us what condition the fort is in. We were really excited to get it at the same time, very depressed because we were looking through like, wow, it's, it's as bad or, as, or it's worse than we thought. Uh, so uh, we're, we did get some money in the capital budget this year to, to try and stabilize and save some of the walls that are in really critical condition. So that should be getting started here very soon. Very, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 James St. Clair Morton was, uh, he was very young. He was in his 30s, a uh, West Point graduate. He was an engineer. By the time the war started and he was made chief engineer of the Army of Ohio, he had an impressive resume. He had already, uh, he was a professor in engineering at West Point. He oversaw a period of the construction of the Washington Monument, uh, oversaw the construction of the Sandy Hook Lighthouse. His first assignment right out of West Point was um, the coastal fortifications in South Carolina. He had, he had gone to Central America and found a canal route or a railroad route. I mean, his, his resume is unbelievable. And um, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of St. Clair Morton. He was, um, he never married. There's not much known about him other than what people said. People in Nashville thought he was absolutely insane. Um, he had long, flowing curly hair. He would ride around on his horse and very nonchalantly point out whose houses needed to be de demolished to make way for his fortifications. Um, but his men um, adored him and they they would follow him anywhere. He was a very, he. they said he would always say, he would never say go, he would say come. Um, and he ended up having a falling out with Rosecrans and he is he is the only army officer in the civil war to request a demotion uh, uh rosecrans gave him a promotion to general he requested to go back down to major he requested he requested a transfer to the ninth corps uh was sent to petersburg and was killed in 1864 scouting on the battlefield. What is really amazing, you've heard the statement that the Civil War was the last ancient war in the first modern war. And Fort Nagley is a fantastic example because believe it or not, at West Point in the 1850s, they were teaching 17th century French fortification design. So this is a, this is a European style, very effective, um, those points are to allow for the cannon to pivot 180 degrees, allow for overlapping fields of fire. Um, it's very difficult to sneak up on a, on a pointed wall like that. It, it really eliminates a lot of blind spots. Uh, the three levels of defense allows for troops to retreat farther and farther inside and make a final stand. And they're just, I mean, they're just really intimidating. And what amazes me is we'll have people come in all the time and they'll watch the videos, they'll come up and they'll spend two hours at the fort and they'll come down and they'll say, well, I guess if it was never attacked, there was no point in building it. And I'm like, <laughs> you completely, I, you know, for a long time, I was like, what is wrong with our interpretation? Why, like this fort was extremely effective. The point was not to be attacked. <laughs> yes, very much so. Very much so. Same concept. Yeah. 17th century French military. Yeah. And I think it's so amazing that you have this ancient fortification style, and then by 1864, you have the most state of the art weapons planted right here. And we'll walk over here into the into these points, into the redans. 
this one, yes. They, there were 75 of them, and they manned all of these guns. Then the other units would camp on the outside of the hill, or on uh, surrounding the hill, sure. and they would rotate in and out, maybe every few months. Or but this fort was constructed for one thousand men. Okay, all right. So I. I never had a garrison that big. No. Yeah, I mean it's. Theoretically, you could hold the full strength. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think I mean it's amazing to imagine. I mean, think about. You know, as a, a warm summer day, there's there's hardly any grass because there's too many people walking around. You're slogging around in mud. Oh, it would have just been miserable. We grow good mud. Here. Miserable. We think that the WPA reconstructed this differently than than they did in the Civil War. We think that during the Civil War. Each of these walls would have been a double wall with with fill, with fill, yeah. and we Crushed think that they, they the WPA just built single walls, which is amazing because in the Civil War this was constructed in four months. The WPA about sixteen months. All right. And um and this the fort was constructed by African Americans, primarily runaway slaves. Sure that came to union lines for safety. Um, and we'll have people all the time say, well, isn't that the same as slavery? Well, I would argue impressment is not the same as slavery. You know, those people were not gathered here for, the, for that specific Purpose. So it's and a wartime expediency. Yeah, it's a wartime measure. Right, measure. right. It's not and exactly it's slavery where paid. their children are going to be. Uh, well, yeah. you know, that the intention was to pay them. Uh, at the end of the war, there was an account with about $90,000 in it uh, for the payment of these laborers. And, but what happened, there was a federal investigation into why the laborers were not paid. And what's interesting, it sounds like the same red tape that we deal with. <laughs> yeah. And we're able to identify ourselves and prove who we are. Unfortunately, this is a whole population of people mm. with no identity, right. no way of mm -hmm. proving who they were. So the 310 people or so that were paid were pointed out directly by a supervisor. If you died, there's no way for your family to claim the money. During the night of December 14th, uh, Granberry's brigade of, uh, from Texas, part of Cheatham's Corps, built this lunette here, which was a, a three-gun battery. Uh, nobody on the federal side recognized it for what it was. The first <coughs> colored brigade, and you need to understand that uh, the black soldiers in the Civil War called themselves colored troops, they were called colored troops, and yes, it's very quaint to the, the 21st century year, and perhaps politically incorrect, but that's what they call themselves, and we'll call them that too. 
attacked a little bit to the to the southeast of us here uh, and came abreast of this battery uh, which fired into them from the flank which did terrible damage to one of the regiments, the 17th U.S. Colored Troops. Uh, the 40 and the, 40, and the 2nd Regiment, which is sort of a half regiment, the 44th, which was behind a 3rd Regiment, the 14th. The 14th actually went across the railroad. Now, it's, the railroad is not like it is here down there. It's, a, it's more or less at a grade. And they were in the rear of the Confederate Army, but that was more of a disaster than a or virtue because the Confederates turned around in their trenches and they brought up a reserve brigade from over there so they were shooting at the 14th USCT from two directions. Uh, there's a lot of commentary about that but the 14th really, we don't really know what happened to the 14th because their commander was in a in a argument with the brigade commander which resulted in the regimental commander being court-martialed and acquitted uh, after the battle, but uh, we we're not real well equipped with reports from him or from the brigade commander, other than the brigade commander saying he was a coward. As soon as this battery started firing the flank, the commander on the, the federal commander on this, this side of the, of the line uh, ordered a small brigade of white troops to attack the lunette itself. And one was the 18th Ohio Infantry, which was sort of a misnomer because it was a consolidation of, I think, six Ohio regiments who had all time expired, and these were leftovers from them. And not very high of morale because uh, you know, all most of your buddies have, uh, have gone home and you're stuck because you signed the wrong papers or you joined too late. And then you had the 1st Battalion of the 14th Army Corps which was composed of new recruits, returning folk from hospital, folks returning from leave, uh, folks that had been arrested and were released from jail. And this was a remarkably unenthusiastic group of soldiers. Uh, many of the recruits were bounty men that uh, were not particularly reliable. Amongst these were some 60, uh, I think I've got the number more or less right, recruits for the 2nd second Minnesota Infantry. 2nd uh, Minnesota at this time, in the middle of December, was most of the way across Georgia to Savannah with the 14th Army Corps. Uh, the 2nd was a very, very, very good regiment. They were veteran volunteers. They fought at Mill Springs. Fought every battle that the Army of the Cumberland had fought. Uh, and so they, the 60 recruits were stuck here. They sustained no casualties, but they had no deserters, uh, which was considered remarkable by the standards of 1864. Uh, many of the casualties in this, this ad hoc brigade were uh, missing, which uh, in, a, in a more honorable context means they were either captured or blown to smithereens. But here, likely as not, they went missing in the midst of Smoky Road in downtown Nashville. and. Uh, uh, evaded the authorities there. Now, as I said, this is not a really good depiction of what a port like this or a lunette like this would look like, simply because it's been filled in with, with rubble from the railroad cut. However, you can see the ditch alongside here. The Confederates planted stakes in the, uh, in the ditch, which prevented a palisade is what it's called, preventing the, the Union soldiers from getting into the fort. This group of uh, 18th Ohio and the 1st Battalion were driven off with uh, fairly heavy casualties, mostly you know, a terrific number of officer casualties, which suggests that the men weren't particularly well motivated. But come on up, you can look and see uh, the, the hey, John, ditch. So uh, yeah. One important thing is to maybe explain to them why Hood had Cheatham's Corps over here when this seems like kind of a minor part of the battle. Well, there wasn't much left of Cheatham's Corps. Yeah. Cheatham's Corps uh, consisted of three divisions, Brown's Division and Claiborne's Division. And it's not Cleburne, it's Claiborne. Keep that in mind. Uh, who had been horribly wrecked at, uh, at Franklin. And the third division was Bates' Division, which 
uh, it was a Tennessee Brigade, a Florida Brigade, and a, and a Georgia Brigade. The Tennesseans loved Bate. The Georgians and Floridians hated him. Um, it, would, it failed at Murfreesboro on December 7th uh, at the Battle of the Cedars and would fail again on Shy's Hill the next day. And it was not a, a happy group of people. But he had him over here um, all this time, of course, before he was down in Murfreesboro with his cavalry uh, and two infantry brigades trying to put the fear of God into the federal garrison in, in Murfreesboro. They had been defeated in, at the Cedars a couple days before. Uh, and of course, Forrest's cavalry was not around. To, this is another command failure on Hood's part. Possibly the best group of horsemen in, in the entire Civil War was off gathering forage outside Murfreesboro when this battle was going on. So uh, someone who could defend this flank and the other flank was not here. Let's walk up and let's look at the fort. Uh, it's owned by the uh, local chapter of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Uh, I think uh, I'm not real happy that they put this path in the middle of what is what was the ditch for the fort, which is one of the few intact things, but that's such as such. such. Uh, this was a, you know, the attack here on this flank was intended more or less as a diversion by Thomas. To, to attract, uh, draw uh, Confederate forces from the western flank along Hillsborough Pike. It, it did not succeed in that, but it was not really necessary. Uh, as that battle went its own course without any trickery involved. Uh, but is, the, is this within range of those really high-powered yes. cannon that are at Fort Nagley? Yep. So yeah, look, 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 over, look over your tree, just back know, behind right there. you, you can see the, the lights to the baseball stadium. Right so why didn't Fort Negley just obliterate this? Well, they didn't now. know it existed until, uh, yeah, the, the, the day commander, the uh, first color brigade, so he reconnoitered the, the uh, area during the night of the 14th and 15th. Yeah. He just thought this was a, what he called a curtain wall here, not a not a full-fledged uh, battery or anything, which uh, would just be kind of like a, like a, you know, a stockade, like you, you know, like you have an Indian War type of thing. Uh, you can see here, if you look over your, you look back in the direction I'm looking, you see the lights from uh, the baseball stadium, which is right next to the Indian. And we are in the line of fire. Okay, this, this is only about a quarter of the dam. And we've extended over the railroad tracks. And, and uh, come back here. As, as I said, another gentleman. This is the back, uh, facing outwards, back left corner of the fort. It would have been open in the back there. Uh, the, this is not the entire of the dam. Of the net. Uh, the railroad just took away so much of it. There's almost as much construction in downtown Nashville as there is in downtown Minneapolis. I think the two cities have a corner on all uh, construction cranes. And if you look uh, at your 10 o'clock, you can see the state capitol. Two o'clock, excuse me. There was a photograph that Krista had at, uh, at Fort Negley showing the railroad tracks and a couple of warehouses. Uh, that These are the railroad tracks up here, although there were a lot more back in 1865. And uh, the photograph was taken one street over to the right. Uh, all very much changed now. But the, the, the railroad layout is exactly the same as it was in 1864, a loop around the, the city. Up here to the left is the state capitol. It was uh, uh, completed in the early 1850s. It's uh, made entirely out of Tennessee limestone. Uh, during the Civil War, it was uh, a fortification called Fort Johnson. Uh, 
actually we've got the Supreme Court building between us and the Capitol right now, but uh, uh, we'll be able to see it in its entirety. There's some interesting statuary on the, on the lawn of the Capitol. We have uh, Sam Davis, the boy hero of the Confederacy, and I'm sure you've never heard of him, but he got hung by the, the Federals. Uh, then we have um, a well-known Tennessee prohibitionist, uh, Carmack, Edward Ward Carmack, whose statue is on top of the Motlow Tunnel. Uh, I guess there's some symbolism there showing that the bootleggers uh, always reigned over, the, were able to get around the uh, prohibitionists. The Motlow family, as you'll know, uh, is Jack Daniels Whiskey. At the beginning of the Civil War, the Tennessee had a population of around 20,000 people. 20 to 25,000 people. At the end of the Civil War, had a population of around, or at, at, before the hostilities ended, had a population of around 70,000. Uh, and, you know, the federal, the, the, the use of the city as a, a tremendous supply base greatly uh, did a lot for the population, uh, both for good and bad. There, there are some some elements which uh, we do not speak of uh, that that came to to Nashville during that time, and uh, some worthwhile people who uh, there's there's a fair number of Nashville families who uh, reluctantly will have to own up to being the descendants of Yankees. So. Uh, although they're few and far between. We are crossing over what used to be the Nashville and Northwestern Railroad. Prior to 1861, this, this only went as far as Pegram, Tennessee, which I defy you to find on a map. Uh, in 1863, what later became the Second Colored Brigade completed the line to Johnsonville on the Tennessee River and defended it. The Second Colored Brigade were basically what we call day uh, combat engineers, which accounts for the fact that they were extremely effective in fighting on the second day at Nashville. Welcome to Redoubt number one. This is one of our properties, uh, one of our two properties. And this is what a uh, Redoubt looks like after 150 years. did the cyclorama did did do a drawing from life and his vantage point is somewhere across Hillsborough Pike here so uh, uh, I'm sorry you can't see that it's going to be going on exhibition on the 1st of December but it'll be really really fun uh, this is this depression here is what's left of redoubt number three uh, most of the redoubt is underneath with parking lot where you're standing and the, and the uh, church education building there to behind you. Uh, uh, back there, that far 
bank. Is that uh, that's a that's a that's a storm uh, storm so water. Was starting where? Did, where did this, it start? the, right here. This would be the the this would be the southwest corner of the fort. There, there. Uh, a little bit of it survives over here. Uh, it was, four, it was four guns and uh, three guns, excuse me, and about a hundred men. So it's not that big. It, it runs over here and uh, behind you and such. That huge depression out there is a is a stormwater runoff. So this was built in 1950 in the church. Nobody then was interested in saving. No. You've got to remember that the battles of Nashville and Franklin were embarrassments to the white southerners. Uh, it, it was extremely, it's like you won't find a national park at Champions Hill in Mississippi because it was uh, it was a Confederate embarrassment. Uh, you had 5,000 or 5,300 prisoners captured here uh, with virtually no, maybe 300 men killed and 5,000 prisoners, 60 odd guns were captured uh, it sort of bespeaks what the morale was of the Confederate Army at that point. Because Franklin, uh, the Confederate Army, claimed a victory because they, they occupied the, the battlefield at the end of the battle, but since it was a rear guard action, that's what the Federals intended. They, they, they wanted to get out of there. And uh, it was an extremely bloody battle, many killed. Uh, no one, I think, really hit upon the the heroics that were displayed by the Confederates in battle in the battle until uh, the middle of last century. So here we have just a little bit of tactics. We, we've talked about this now twice today as we came up uh, Valley Brook and Cross Creek. The Federals came from that direction that way. Uh, that's the that's the street I live on there. I've, I've walked this a million times. Uh, came up here. They're under fire from Confederates who were down number two, which is, now think of the, think of the shot the guy made from, can you look over there and see the, the condominium uh, across from the White Steeple Church? He was shooting from there. Picked off a guy on a horse right there. Uh, that's not a bad shot. Uh, uh, he was moving. He wasn't sitting around doing nothing. Uh, he was on a horse. And uh, came up here, overran the, the battery, captured, they were in the process of trying to get the guns out. They captured two in the battery, in the redoubt itself, and one while they were trying to get it across the road. Uh, this was the 7th Minnesota. At this point, Colonel Marshall was commanding it. Uh, and he had been commander of the 7th Minnesota. He was now the brigade commander. Okay. Now, any questions? I guess I have a comment. I understand the theory of you know, the South not wanting to save because it was like an embarrassment. But on the other hand, I'm surprised that they didn't want to save more of the places where their boys fought and died. That that would have been a, way, a, a reason to save things. Yeah, and it's always mystified me about Franklin because there is such, that cemetery is such a beautiful memorial. Uh, and the story about it, it's even more beautiful than this is Gavin. But uh, they just can't, there's no accounting for it. And, you know, it uh, it's not something we've gotten to appreciate until now. Really. Uh, yeah, that's, that's that. This is a, it shows you, you know, if you let things go, this is what happens to battle for restoration. And recovery battle. Today? Do you think most of the people now that live here understand what happened here, or no. do they not? No. Um, we constantly find people amazed at uh, you know, the level of Civil War ignorance is pretty high. And that, uh, yeah, I can excuse that. I mean, how many people need to know who commanded what regiment? Uh, but the Civil War in itself had had so much impact on all of American society for not just at the time, but for more than 100 years of the civil rights struggle thereafter. 
Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out, I, I don't know if you, any of you have read any of Drew Gilpin Faust's books, Mothers of Invention or This Republic of Suffering. Uh, Mothers of Invention is a great read, really, by the way. But she addresses women's history in connection with the Civil War. In post-bellum South, he has an entire generation of widows and spinsters mm -hmm. who gave themselves, by and large, over to good works. Mm -hmm. Here in Nashville, we've got uh, ladies named Fanny Battle, uh, Martha O'Brien, Florence Crittenden, uh, who were prominent in the field of doing good works, helping the poor, helping orphans, helping widows, and creating social agencies. Uh, keep in mind that, uh, you know, from a feminist standpoint, Tennessee is a state that pushed the 19th Amendment over the top. And it, it was in 1920, and it was a, an alliance, uh, which sounds strange, 21st century years, of Republicans and feminists. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't say strange that fellows, but I just did. But uh, uh, that, that uh, was very interesting. Yeah, so much, the Civil War has had so much impact on our country's history that a knowledge of it and a knowledge of what it resulted in is essential for our understanding of America even today. Mm -hmm. That's my two cents for it. That's what makes it worthwhile. But it's also fun, too, uh, to be able to shoot off names of, of regimental commanders and uh, uh, saying, oh no, the 11th Missouri was next to the 5th. Minnesota, you doofus. Uh, there's <laughs> things like this. They make great, great party tricks in the right crowd. <coughs> what? They make great party tricks in the right crowd. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah we have mm -hmm. all our Civil War trivia things. Uh, uh, I pulled one today that the fellow I asked, where is he? Mr. Mr. Screaming Eagle. Me, right here. Oh, is that you? <laughs> yeah. Okay, you have your hat on. I don't recognize you. Uh, <laughs> But I had, uh, you know, what uh, United States Army institution, I've given myself away, commemorates uh, two Wisconsin, reg or, uh, Wisconsin regiments in the Civil War. I mean, first airborne. The Eagle from the 8th Wisconsin, Black Shield from the Black Hat. Because of Wisconsin. So, you know, you still get play Civil War trivia half the time. What we're going to do now is we're going to do Shy's Hill. So they're still predicting rain for tomorrow? Uh, you, yeah. So we don't have to route the hill in the mud like, like, uh, like uh, the real best southern state back right there. <laughs> All the property that's feasible feasible to pick up, we own or have easements on or are owned and protected by someone else. Uh, the only exception would be that trench line running through that person's front yard. And that's, that's a seven-figure house there. Uh, we're not going to buy that. It's a beautiful house, too, by the way. I don't know if you saw it. It's uh, good Tennessee limestone there. And uh, yeah, that's the only thing that would be left to pick up. Um, there's, there's so little left. Our, one of our great legends of the battle that took place on that afternoon, that's the story of Mary Bradford, who was a, a uh, well -to daughter of a well-to-do farmer out here on off of Granny's White Pike. We'll, we'll pass by her home, or near her home, take a left here. Uh, who went out to help at a Confederate hospital or field hospital and had assisted in an amputation when two brigades of Alabamians came, came uh, retreating rather quickly past them on Granny White Pike. Uh, Someone said they were moving at a speed that suggested that Alabama Auburn tickets were available for free in Brentwood. Uh, but uh, uh, perhaps they're moving some more slowly than that. But nonetheless, they were retreating with some vigor, and she came out of the hospital across the intersection, uh, which was basically a little country schoolhouse, tiny country schoolhouse, and started speaking to them in language that. Uh, uh, one of the people said was rather harsh for a lady, which she definitely was, and uh, apparently had some effect on them to stop retreating quite so quickly at least. Uh, she was 28 years old at the 
time, in 1864, which made her uh, a little bit old to be unmarried at that time in our history. Uh, but she did marry after the war. She married her childhood sweetheart, a fellow named John Johns. Uh, sounds like somebody being on Catch-22. And having been impoverished by the Civil War, she went into, did what uh, a genteel, educated Southern woman would do in that circumstance. So she went to teaching uh, at a, uh, to, in the, in the teaching career, and she taught at a, uh, an all-boys school that was established after the Civil War called Montgomery Bell Academy. And she had two sons and a daughter. Uh, MBA has prided itself over its 140-odd years of existence on uh, uh, never having had a woman student. Uh, that's a lie. Because Mary Bradford's daughter, uh, not being able to afford the tuition at, at, at uh, a school some, you know, suitable for her, attended Montgomery Bell Academy during her primary school years. And in fact, we have pic there are pictures of her. So, uh, uh, as a as, as a student in an alumni gathering, so so she uh, was in fact the only girl ever to attend Montgomery and Bell Academy. Her sons were students in the uh, at the school during the 1880s, and they had school yearbooks. And of course, the mother was a teacher at the time. And the comment of the yearbook editors is they found it hard to imagine how how two such hellions as their sons could be the, the sons of such a, a genteel and polite and kind southern lady. Uh, apparently they didn't have access to uh, uh, whatever she had said uh, uh, to those two Confederate brigades, which would sort of give a lie to it all, right? But she is part of our Nashville uh, Battle of Nashville legends. Her daughter lived to be a hundred and died in 1979. Wow. At this intersection, which was not an intersection in 1865, <laughs> right over here on this side of the creek was where the little schoolhouse was, uh, where Mary Bradford was ministering to, to the uh, injured Confederates. And of course, to this day, the other side of the intersection is still a school. Granny White, uh, the lines for MacArthur's division are going to be about right here where the 15 mile an hour sign is. If you look to your right at uh, your 3 o'clock, right underneath the sun, you will see Shai's Hill. And this is the Granny White, and to the, to the right of the road here, is where the 5th Minnesota attacked, they were right here. And the Howard Powell painting is taken at that intersection, which you can see about 100, mile, 100 yards in from the light. 5th Minnesota broke through the line there. 11th Missouri. What? 8th Wisconsin. Ninth Minnesota, take the left, next left. Tenth Minnesota. And up here you'll see. Everybody got to cover their eyes, you can't see the monument. Right, good, doesn't it? Stop right here. Yeah. We own we own the hillside, the Tennessee Historical Society owns the top. We also own that house there.
as you can see by the concrete base here, there are that big water tower here from 1950 to 1960. And in putting it in, they flattened off the top of the hill. The trench line around the hilltop is actually an approximation. But uh, keep in mind that this was a rounded top on this hill. Uh, which brings us to CSI Nashville. Uh, we know that Colonel William Shy, commander of the 20th Tennessee Regiment, and also of many of the remnant Tennessee Regiments that fought here, was shot through his forehead with a bullet descending at the back of his head. So he was shot from above. Uh, how do we know this? Grave robbers. Um, he was killed in the battle, uh, buried at his home in Williamson County in 1977. Seven. Thank you. Uh, you know the story better than I do. Uh, thieves uh, uh, dug up his body and stole it. Nobody seems to have caught on to the fact that it would have been uh, Shy himself, simply because the soil around here does not, the bodies deteriorate rather rapidly, and the body that they found was, looked like someone had been dead for about three or four months, which was pretty bad, but nonetheless was still more or less intact. And so they figured that someone had, uh, had murdered somebody and, and sought to hide the, the, uh, the body in Shy's grave. Uh, the body was headless, or so they thought, and when they went to rebury or to pull out the, the coffin, it was a cast iron coffin which had been sealed, they found the head inside the coffin, and this was in fact Colonel Shaw. And so we have the benefit of a 20th century autopsy on a 19th century Civil War death, so we know exactly how he got shot. And what uh, probably happened was uh, I don't know if you heard me down there, about at the, at the uh, point where we, the, the uh, switchback switches the second time over towards the, the line here, that was the boundary between uh, Tyler's Tennessee Brigade and Finley's Florida Brigade, which is where the 10th Minnesota broke through. About half the 10th Minnesota chased the Floridians down the hill, the other half of the 10th Minnesota uh, came up the hill and over the top where their brigade mates from Illinois were attacking the front. They came over the top of the hill and very likely one of them shot Colonel Chai as he was in his trench turning around to, to fire at them. They were being attacked from two sides at once. And so that's why you have a downward bullet. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, stories about uh, shy being found naked and bayoneted to a tree and uh, I hate to break it to you but when you're fighting a battle you don't have time to take clothes off a dead guy and, and stick him to a tree. Uh, that's a Confederate atrocity story. He was, he was buried and there were no bayonet wounds on him by the way when they did the autopsy so kind of put the lie to that. So we had CSI Nashville, uh, a very interesting little thing here. But, all three about brigades. Where, about in, where would he have been shot? Uh, he's probably about right behind you, Dean. Uh, over there. Yeah. They were coming over the top of the hill, and he was in the mid middle of his brigade with his regiment. I'm not positive where they had the 20th in particular line, but you know we've always placed him over on this side, on that side of the hill, and. Yeah, you get guys shooting at you from two directions at once. It it it's not it's not gonna last very long. And he was he was killed. Uh, if you come over here, this is a good time of the year to be up here. By the way, over that little yeah, he, he was fighting about where oh uh, about where I'm standing here. And again, you can see how how. Uh, you know, they could be coming up the hill and they only become visible about 20 feet away. Uh, that's where the slope of the hill is. I think it's a nice street right there. Because we could get uh, access to the, uh, relatively easy access to the top of the hill. 
You should be able to see the Confederate trench line headed down that other way. It's not real clear right now, but uh, we get Jim and Philip here tomorrow. You should be able to see it more clearly. So, yeah, we, we try and keep the brush clear. And, uh, what happened over here? The, the Confederate trench line runs. There's a, there's a hill with two cell phone towers. Uh, you can't see them, but that's the end of the Confederate line. And over across this valley here was the 23rd Corps under Schofield. Thomas is over there down at the bottom of the hill saying, Schofield, why aren't you attacking? Why aren't you attacking? I've told you to attack. Oh, I'm afraid the hood's going to hit me in the flank. It's going to attack me to the flank. And at that point, I think you heard me tell the story of uh, uh, General MacArthur sent uh, a messenger over to General, General Smith and General Thomas and said, if I don't hear from you in five minutes, I'm attacking. And he did. And as soon as they started attacking, Thomas looked at Schofield and said, the 16th Corps is attacking, why aren't you? And at that point, the 23rd Corps began its attack. Uh, and contribute a little bit to the victory, but not like the 16th Corps did. There were no Minnesotans in the 23rd Corps. So where was the 5th Minnesota in relationship to the others? The 5th Minnesota was down, uh, uh, we were on the bus, I pointed out where they did their attack, and the 5th mm -hmm. Minnesota is the Howard Powell painting. Mm -hmm. uh, they are actually charging downhill from, what it's, uh, it's a Girl Scout Center, uh, to a stone wall which is about 100 and 20 yards to the south of Battery Lane, the street that we turned off of. And um, uh, that's, that's where they attacked. They broke through the line too because the Confederates were shooting at 10th Minnesota and 9th Minnesota, which are on top of the hill. Uh, the the Shaw's Hill takes a, a bend like that from the Confederate line, so it's a salient. And the Union troops, were, the two Minnesota regiments, were coming up this side of Salem, and the troops at the bottom, the Confederates at the bottom hill, said, "Hey, we can shoot these guys in the flank." So they're all running out in front of their lines to shoot at the two Minnesota regiments attacking at the top of the hill. Didn't notice that the Fifth Minnesota and the Eleventh Missouri were coming straight at them, and it was uh, much like at Franklin the day uh, on November 30th when. Uh, you had that brigade, uh, that division out in front of the Union line, where the the uh, Confederates chased them into the into the Union line at Franklin. The Fifth Minnesota and Eleventh Missouri chased these skirmishers. Everybody was going across the Confederate line at once, and the result was the Confederate line broke. So it's at the bottom of the hill. Seventh Minnesota is on the other side of Granny White. They're attacking at a creek bottom. The Thomas is down there. Yeah. He was not happy with Schofield. No. So it was wooded similar to what we see. Yes, now. it's very similar to what it is now. Yeah. Okay. Well, we all go down to the bottom of the hill.
Okay, we're headed north on Granny White Pike. During the Civil War, this would have been a one-lane road. It would have had stone walls like you see to your right on both sides of the road. These are the actual antebellum walls here to the right. So it gives you an idea of the, the road right of way. Uh, the road, the walls were knocked down at various points to allow Confederate wagons and artillery to get into the fields. All right, um, Shaw's Hill is over to your left there. It's silhouetted against the setting sun. And right up here on your left, slow down a little bit if you would, please. You'll see a that where you see, you see a street up there where the, the light is. Okay, that's MacArthur Park Terrace, a terribly named road to think of some terrible song. But this is this is the aspect, if you were the painter, Howard Pyle, you see right to the right of the bus here, looking down away towards the hill. This is the little wall that the 5th Minnesota is depicted overrunning.